The next uh, presenters, Mamie Laferge and Dr. Kathy Holtman, uh, will be giving a presentation on improving domestic violence services in rural, remote, and northern regions of Canada. Mamie is a postdoctoral fellow at the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research and the Department of Sociology at UMB. She holds a PhD in Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies collaborative program in transitional justice and post-conflict reconstruction from Western University. Her doctoral research explored trauma-informed relational and embodied approaches to addressing violence, including wartime violence, structural systematic violence, family violence, and gender-based violence in post-conflict Columbia in collaboration with a nonprofit peace-building organization, Dana. Dr. Holtman is the chair of the sociology department and director of the MMFC. She is the academic co-chair of the religion and violence, uh, as well as the violence against immigrant and visible minority women research teams at the center. Her research focuses on gender and religion, domestic violence, immigrant women, and, the so and social action. She is a co-investigator with the Canadian research team on the project Violence Against Women Migrants and Refugees, Analyzing Causes and Effective Policy Response, and represents the MMFC on the New Brunswick Roundtable on Crime and Public Safety. It's my pleasure to invite you both up to give your presentation this morning. Thank you, Sheila, for that lovely introduction. Um, I would uh, like to, first of all, start by thanking Mamie. Uh, Mamie has been the postdoctoral fellow at the center for the past year, and we've had um, multiple opportunities to work together. And so I, I want to thank Mamie because she's done her postdoctoral fellowship. She was a fellowship. So although I'm, I was sad to, to end it, uh, very grateful for all the work that we did together, including the work on this paper. This is uh, the second time we're presenting on this data. So today's presentations um, are being filmed and so eventually the presentation will be on our website. But the video of the first time we presented is currently on the website. We presented as part of a webinar in uh, September, on September 14th. So if you want to get more details about the first part of our presentation today, you can take a look at that video. So yeah, I'm doing the slide thing see if it works. Look at that. Okay. So uh, the data that we're going to be talking about today, the analysis of the data comes from a national project called the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative with Vulnerable Populations. Mm -hmm. Say that five times really fast, okay? <laughs> Anyway, um, Mary Aspinall, who's here, was uh, a research assistant on that project, and the center was uh, a partner on that project, which was a national project in scope. And what's really amazing about that project, in addition to um, all the great work it did, is that the data from that project, which is both quantitative and qualitative, is being shared across the country. And particularly, the sharing of qualitative data is not something we um, do on a regular basis in Canada. So I think this is a, a bit of a groundbreaker and hopefully bodes well for the future. Uh, in terms of sharing um, and analyzing, you know, uh, second, doing secondary analysis on, on qualitative data. So we're grateful to the project. The uh, project aimed to uh, look um, primarily at reducing and managing risk. So risk assessment, risk management, and safety planning. And then fostering collaborative uh, research. And so uh, in addition to academic researchers in this project, there were community partners as well as government. And then um, to enhance uh, our, our work on the ground and, and inform it. So uh, just a little bit in terms of how the data was collected. So um, we recruited survivors of severe, for the qualitative part of this study that we're looking at, the survivors of severe uh, domestic and intimate partner violence were recruited through um, a, a press conference. So all of the centers had uh, coordinated press conferences across the country. Uh, we had um, uh, information about the study on our website. We used uh, social media and uh, service provider networks as well as email. And the social media part was interesting, <laughs> to say the least, Mary. So uh, CBC 
had done um, a few sort of profiles on domestic violence where survivors um, were interviewed. And so we actually, because they were public, we actually uh, used social media to direct message them, which felt a bit weird in terms of recruitment. But because they had gone public with the media, we contacted them, of course, you know, it was up to them whether they answered our call. But uh, we were, um, uh, yeah, we, we used a, a variety of strategies of recruitment. Then there were screening interviews because obviously uh, they are survivors or the close family of survivors. We also recruited them, uh, family and friends of uh, someone who was not a survivor, someone who died as a result of domestic violence. And so all of these people have experienced, uh, um, you know, severe domestic violence or been exposed to severe domestic violence and uh, could be uh, dealing with trauma. And so we, we, we did screening interviews to ensure that they were uh, well, that they were no longer in situations of uh, potential uh, lethal violence, and that they had support systems in place um, not only for, for dealing with that experience, but also um, after the, the interview process. So uh, the screening interviews determined whether they were uh, eligible also in terms of the four groups that we were looking at in terms of vulnerable populations. And so that included uh, people who live in rural, remote, and northern areas, uh, immigrant survivors, uh, indigenous survivors, and then children who had been uh, part of domestic violence services. And so uh, we did the screening interviews, and then the interviews were conducted by uh, graduate research assistants, um, one, one of whom was Mary Aspinall, and I also worked with um, Megan out of uh, Dalhousie University as well. So what we are going to be talking about, and our sample consists of survivors from rural, remote, and northern regions of Canada who are non-Indigenous and non-Francophone. And so we have access to the transcripts of 29 survivors. We're not uh, using data from uh, loved ones or close friends because we just felt that that was a different uh, uh, data set. And so we've uh, analyzed 18 of those interview transcripts so far. So uh, prior to sort of to situate this, what do we know um, currently about uh, rural, remote and northern populations and their experiences of domestic and intimate partner violence? Well, we know that the rates of domestic homicide in rural Canada are significantly higher than in urban areas. From 2010 to 2018, there were 192 victims of domestic homicide from these regions. And the identified risk factors include uh, almost three quarters of the victims were either currently in a relationship with the, uh, the accused or in a, had, had been in a relationship with the accused um, who ended up killing them. Uh, over a third um, of those situations, the perpetrator had access to firearms. Uh, just about a third had a history of domestic and intimate partner violence. And then uh, 25, about 25% 25 had evidence of um, a pending separation. So the following slides are going to detail um, some of our preliminary findings from our analysis. So first, we're going to identify some of the vulnerabilities that came up um, as identified directly by survivors. And then we're going to move into what survivors identified as possible solutions to some of the systemic barriers that they encountered. So we're going to overview a few broad themes that have been surfacing, but we're also going to provide direct quotes from the survivors. So um, the quotes that you'll see on the screen are really from the words um, of survivors and from their lived experience. So we feel that they really provide sort of a snapshot of these fragments in time, but also of the geographic and social landscapes. Um, that are characteristic of rural, remote, and northern communities, and the aspects of those communities that make them particularly vulnerable um, when dealing with IPV. So we wanted to start off with a quote that we feel really captures a lot of the intersecting nuances that we're going to be discussing um, throughout the next 40 minutes or so. So in this quote, the survivor's abuser was her father, he abused her, her mother, and siblings over a multi-year period. Um, <coughs> she explained in the interview that her mother was isolated in a rural community um, and they lived on a large property. 
the abuser didn't want the mother to go to town, work outside the home. Um, the abuser had full financial control over the mother um, and the financial control and the isolation were really key parts of the abuse cycle. So the survivor explained that her and her siblings really fell through the cracks of care growing up. She felt that um, the parents of her friends or teachers at school had some insight into the domestic violence, but um, didn't report and didn't know how to deal with it. Um, she also felt in their particular case that the police had not been particularly helpful. Um, and this was partially a dynamic of it being a small town that the police officers um, involved in responding actually knew um, the father. Um, and in general, she felt that there weren't enough services and the services there um, lacked IPV specific training. Um, there was also no local shelter or services um, available in the region. And um, because of the isolation and different factors, um, the mom was not likely to um, uproot and go um, with the children <coughs> to, uh, to the city. So in this quote, um, we're seeing a situation soon after the parents separated. Um, this survivor was in high school at the time and she explains, it was probably 11 p.m. and we're driving down these rural back roads, which were very dark, isolated. There's obviously no street lights. There's not a lot of houses, just a lot of nothing. <clears throat> so she goes on to describe an argument between them. She's hoping her father will pay for a dress for her graduation. It leads to a heated argument, um, which then results in an incident of abuse. She says, he absolutely lost it like he was yelling, he was furious. And then she goes on to say, he stopped the truck in the middle of the road, reached over me, opened the door, threw out my overnight bag onto the ground, unbuckled my seatbelt, grabbed me by my shoulders and pushed me out of the truck, closed the door and drove away. And in a rural area, she had no um, cell phone connection and had to um, walk for many miles in order to call. Uh, for help. <clears throat> okay. So we wanted to go through um, a few of the characteristics um, that we saw come out in that quote and that really are um, streamlined throughout many of the um, survivor um, interviews that we've read. So the first really is this sense of isolation. Um, both geographically and physically. Um, so things like I just mentioned, um, being in a remote area, having few neighbors, knowing that you live far enough from neighbors that no one is going to hear the violent incident or that you might have difficulty um, running for help. Um, many of the survivors interviewed lived on large farm properties. Um, and that also meant not just isolation, but they maybe also had multiple pets or farm animals, and they were also concerned for their safety in addition um, to children. Um, and then of course, living far from services and supports um, and maybe lacking transportation, time, finances in order to travel back and forth. Um, and that obviously meant difficulty um, accessing things like a shelter or medical care. Um, <clears throat> it also meant um, it may be experiencing long wait times for emergency services to arrive um, at the time of a violent incident. So we also witnessed um, a lot of social isolation, um, folks feeling isolated from friends and family, um, Things like cell phone reception and good internet connection um, were also mentioned as barriers in uh, rural communities. Um, and those were barriers to seeking both formal and informal help. Um, and a lack of um, IPV specific services, but also IPV training in existing services. So spaces like the police um, schools, uh, medical facilities, also lacking that IPV angle to really I identify what is happening. Um, yeah. So 
So in the next few minutes, we're going to um, explore these themes that I just mentioned through discussing four specific topics. So we're going to look more at this lack of confidentiality in rural communities, um, a lack of awareness about what abuse is, because that's something that um, has surfaced over and over. Um, and then we want to briefly discuss the impact of shelters um, on the lives of survivors and then the role of police as well. So the first topic that we wanted to discuss um, is about confidentiality in rural communities. So this sense that the whole town knew um, was really a reoccurring theme that we encountered um, looking at the data. So in many cases, these are um, survivors from very small towns, um, communities with a lot of tight knit and family um, relationships. So folks who are very intertwined and connected. So the likelihood of the police officer or maybe the first responder or um, the domestic violence outreach worker being someone that you know or an acquaintance of someone you know is quite um, common. So because of that, survivors were afraid to report because they didn't know if it would be kept confidential or if there could be repercussions or they wouldn't be believed or they would become the talk of the town, these types of things. Um, <clears throat> and that um, fear of reporting was also seen um, amongst bystanders, folks who were witnessing the violence, but were afraid of the repercussions um, if they came forward with information. Um, there were fears of possible retaliation against them, or, you know, what if he's not charged and sent to jail, then he comes after me, those types of um, fears in the community. <clears throat> okay. So the second theme that we identified in terms of, you know, sort of laying the ground for what's happening in these, in these survivors' lives is the difficulty identifying abuse and seeking help. And so, you know, this was, you know, we looked at transcripts of survivors of, you know, potentially lethal domestic violence. And it was very interesting, um, the number who, it wasn't until they uh, sought help from usually a, a shelter uh, or a, a domestic violence outreach worker that they were able to name that what was happening to them was domestic violence. So if you remember the first slide, everybody knows that something's going on and something's wrong, but nobody's naming it for what it is, okay? And, and even the survivor, because they don't have a language until they meet a service provider who's specially trained in responding to survivors' domestic violence. And so they're unable to see the warning signs, the community um, in which they are part of, in, in the case of, of several of them, many of them, or several of them were part of religious communities. There was no um, talking about what domestic violence was, and so they were not able to identify it in their relationships. Uh, survivors were confused overwhelmed and embarrassed. There was a lot of shame um, because of these tight hit communities. Uh, there was um, uh, in families, it, it either went one way or the other. So either families were very supportive or how, what could you have, what, what did you do to, to make this happen? You know, and then the, the families would isolate because, you know, we're not gonna talk to you as long as you're with that guy. Okay, so it, um, you know, there was a lot of confusion and um, lack of support from people closest to them. Uh, fear of losing the children and being seen as an unfit parent. And then uh, fear of being stigmatized as having mental health problems, okay? So this, this, this is, there's a problem in your relationship because there's something wrong with your mental health, okay? And, um, and, and many of them felt that they were not going to be believed or they'd had experiences where they were not believed by service providers. Um, yeah, we felt it was important to briefly mention the critical role that shelters played if survivors were able to access them. Um, almost all of the transcripts spoke about either barriers to accessing shelters and the services that shelters offer, or um, really uh, positive experiences um, 
attending shelters or seeking resources from them. So um, survivors explained that um, shelter spaces really offered a non-judgmental um, space for support and validation from the staff, but also the opportunity to meet other survivors, whether that be informally from staying at the shelter or through organized um, peer support groups. Um, survivors also reported that the shelters played a vital link to other community-based resources that they maybe wouldn't have found. So things like uh, mental health support, um, addiction support, and really um, a multitude of community-based services, um, things like legal aid or um, resources for children. Um, there was really a, a wide variety of um, community services that shelters provided that vital link. Um, Many reported that um, the shelters were such a critical um, source of education. Like Kathy was saying, really giving you that language to um, be able to name and identify what you're um, going through. And also um, critical things like safety planning and having someone who sort of knows where you are and um, helps you make the next steps, which can be really overwhelming. Um, frequently, shelters were described as a safe space, um, sort of in terms of these like emotional and relational um, aspects of going to a shelter that I just described, but also safety in the sense of security. You could really put your head down at night knowing that there's security guards um, that the house is being monitored. Um, so that aspect of safety was also discussed. Um, and then of course, shelters are not always available. Um, and especially for rural communities, it was a barrier to need to leave your home, um, your farm. Um, it could even mean things like your children would have to go to a new school. Um, so those types of things made it really hard if there wasn't a local um, shelter or um, accessible outreach services to connect. Um, that really posed barriers. Um, survivors also told us that they found it difficult to go to a shelter in some cases with um, the whole family and sometimes lacked um, just the, the space and, and normalcy of uh, your own routines, like dinner time as, as a family. And uh, we know that shelters are under-resourced and, under and just don't have those capacities. Um, and we also saw in a few cases that there are a lot of misconceptions and still some stigma around going to shelters. Um, so the idea that you know, you would have to be homeless or unemployed in order to qualify to go. Um, those types of um, ideas came up as well. And finally, there were a lot of there was a lot of data in terms of um, the role of police and the response of police, and they were very varied. Okay, so they went from positive responses to uh, very critical uh, responses of of the police. Um, and it was complicated. And I just want to talk about one piece that we find kind of fascinating is that um, some of the perpetrators seem to be part of criminal networks. And so the women who were being victimized by their partner were by association um, seen as part of these criminal networks. And so when they would come forward or try to get help in a situation of IPV, they, that was not believed, right? Like they were seen as um, criminals rather than victims. And, um, and it wasn't understood. There were several cases where uh, part of the IPV was forcing the woman to commit crimes on behalf of, of the perpetrator and his network. And police were very focused on solving this larger problem. And they just seemed to be like sort of collateral damage. Um, in, in solving larger networks of crime and treated as, as uh, criminals rather than as victims. And so our question was like, you know, who's the deserving victim? You know, like if you're not part of something uh, criminal, then you, it was easier for, I guess, police to identify you as, as being a victim of domestic violence. 
So, so far we've highlighted um, several of the vulnerabilities that we identified, but we also wanted to talk about some of the solutions. So survivors in the interviews were also asked about um, what they think about um, changes within the system. What would they have done differently? What would they have needed that they didn't get? Um, and also what type of advice they would offer to someone going through um, a similar situation. So we found that aspect of the transcripts to be also really fascinating because it's solutions oriented and um, that's something we want to focus on in, in future research as well. So some of the main solutions identified by survivors were um, more um, early intervention and prevention work options in communities, community-based awareness, um, enhanced community-coordinated responses between different agencies and service providers, uh, specialized training for rural service providers and police, um, as well as, of course, a variety of uh, different financial supports that could be really useful um, were mentioned throughout transcripts as well. So the first is the sense of um, early intervention and prevention. So in several cases, survivors felt that um, had those involved, whether it be you know the, the parents um, and it was a child survivor speaking, or um, had the perpetrators sort of had intervention earlier on, maybe the violence wouldn't have escalated um, the way it did. Um, so one thing that was talked about um, a few, quite a few times is the critical role that schools can play, um, both in helping children exposed to violence and be able to better name and identify what they're experiencing, but also for teachers to be trained as bystanders and to know um, how to report and how to support students. Um, and also something that came up that was interesting was um, the need for other students and peers to be aware as well, to be identifying um, warning signs and know how to safely report to an adult or a parent. Um, it was also mentioned that there really is a need for more um, community-based violence prevention training programs, um, things targeted towards um, parenting skills, um, extra assistance for parents um, who are sort of in conflict or having difficulties, um, basically more resources to help families cope with stress before they um, escalate to um, domestic violence. Um, things that would assist with um, emotional regulation, having outlets um, to process anger. Um, and survivors also reported a general need for more individual, but also family-centered mental health care resources. So that could include um, low cost options, um, flexible options, in-person um, online options, um, programs that would involve um, children as well. Um, so there was this sense of more can be done within our communities and within our support um, structures to better support um, prevention, but also to better support those who are uh, experiencing violence, um, especially in these rural contexts that we, we've <laughs> been talking about in terms of um, feeling like everybody knows your business in a small town and you don't know who to trust. Um, and as bystanders, not really knowing how to um, best support or to report or the fear that if you report, it will actually make it worse for the people going through it. So just more information all around. Um, So we wanted to um, share a quote related to this topic that we thought was um, really impactful. So in this quote, the survivor talks about the importance of child victims being able to identify and name abuse um, that they or their peers are experiencing. So in this case, um, this is a someone that we interviewed um, as an adult, but they were talking about the abuse that they were seeing in their family as a child. So they say, I was in fourth grade and I remember where I was when I found out that other people's parents didn't hit them. 
I remember one of my best friends being like, mom's going to be so mad at me. And me being like, oh my God, why aren't you reacting more? They would get a bad mark on a test. And I would think that the reaction was so weird. Aren't you terrified? Because in their family context, that would have led to abuse. Yeah, and this is really, I think really significant for us to keep in mind, right? Like these are recent interviews and it really mirrors. Now they, this could be from anywhere in Canada, but I'm, I'm cognizant of our colleagues uh, from University of Moncton that have been doing work with um, uh, university students at the University of Moncton to help them talk about uh, sexual assault and consent. And in their transcripts as well, you know, students either in high school or in university for the first time realizing, oh my God, what happened to me was violence, right? And so this is a contemporary issue. This is not something, you know, even though many of us have been working in this area for, for many, many years, it's persistent. They do not have the framework to identify what they're experiencing as, as violence. And fortunately, in many of these educational settings is the time where they hear about it, but then the supports aren't there, right? In terms of how do they then deal with it. So the next uh, area of suggestion was about raising community awareness. As we said, there is um, a lot of um, um, lack of understanding or a lack of a vocabulary to name what's going on, but also the enormous uh, stigma that exists. Now it's shelters more often than not or domestic violence outreach workers that tend to be the people that help them uh, name what's going on. But as we know, uh, shelters across the country are under-resourced, okay? And the pandemic has made that very, very clear. Um, but they're highly regarded. I, yeah, like either they didn't know or they couldn't access, but every time they did, I don't know that we had a single transcript where they said it was not helpful. Mm -hmm. And what was very interesting, as Mamie mentioned, it's one of the few times they feel safe, okay? Because you think about rural, you know lots about rural New Brunswick. You think big vehicles and guns. You know, we had several uh, transcripts where a woman uh, said, it wasn't until she got to a shelter that she could open a window and sleep with fresh air. That's how terrified they live. Uh, the role of informal support is really, really important. As we know, most survivors are most likely to first tell someone that they know, a uh, friend. And so, um, you know, the awareness raising is important, but also um, not simply that they, they understand but they know how to help and so to accompany them. This was something survivors said because their interaction with police was so fraught, they kept saying, you know, if I had somebody with me who could be a witness to how I was treated, like they didn't believe me or they belittled me or, you know, they wanted information about, you know, my partner's criminal activities. And, and so they said, you know, if I had taken somebody with then I would have had a witness to how badly I was treated or the fact that I wasn't believed. So there was like, always take somebody with you. The other, um, they were aware that because often they are seeking support after um, a crisis inc incident, they themselves are not able to take in all the information that they're receiving. And so they're like, yeah, take somebody with you because it will help you in processing that information in the long term. So not only uh, teaching people about uh, domestic violence, but also helping them to respond appropriately. And so to go with the survivor to, to these, um, to, when they go to see a service, a service provider. Again, uh, public awareness, and then a lot on how best to support children, almost in all cases. I don't think we've had any cases where there haven't been children involved. And so, um, you know, what, what to do, uh, you know, with these children who more often than not have been exposed to domestic violence. So we have a, a quote here, and it, it addresses the stigma in calling the police and um, that's something what, that my friend's mom said often is we didn't call anybody. We knew this kind of stuff was going on, but we didn't call because we were afraid it would make it worse for you guys. And I think it's true. Like, I don't think 
I don't think it's because of lack of awareness. These are very dangerous people, you know, and, um, and it's known to the community that they're dangerous people. Uh, and so this real hesitancy to, to intervene in a way that could be safe, you know, and so, um, you know, even accompanying a friend, how would you do that in a way that the perpetrator doesn't know that that's what you're doing, right? So it is a good idea to, to want to help, but how could you help in a way that's safe in a rural community um, and, and taking those rural realities into consideration because it's, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, we'll, we'll say we're going to a coffee shop and then we'll go see a domestic violence outreach, or outreach worker. Well, you need a vehicle to get anywhere, you know? And so there's gonna be a question, well, where did you guys go? And there is no shopping in our town. So you couldn't have gone shopping. Like, what did you do, you know? And so there has to be, um, I think a lot of uh, uh, strategic thinking in around, how can you be a supportive bystander, but at the same time, keep you and your own family safe? We also heard a lot about the importance of community coordinated and collaborative responses. Um, specifically, survivors talked about the need to bridge um, emergency care and response with longer term supports and services, um, whether that be for mental health or just more of a continuity of care. What happens after the police come? What happens after the arrest? And um, often it's left on the survivor to go and seek out a bunch of supports, but if there could be more linking those sort of um, first response parts of IPV intervention with the longer term care. Um, we also heard about the need for um, more mechanisms for sharing confidentiality between agencies and service providers. So ensuring that um, the information is shared, but shared safely. Um, I'm thinking of one survivor's testimony in particular, where she was saying that she found it to be really re-triggering um, to meet with provider after provider and to start at zero and recount the whole story of abuse. And in her case, um, she was very high risk and um, actually being moved from community to community um, for her safety. So there was a lot of just really reopening the wounds. And she felt like if there had been a sort of confidential file that could be shared from you know, one doctor to another or from the police um, to the, the shelter or transition home or um, second stage housing coordinators, um, that it would have been a lot less traumatizing for her um, if there could have been um, a, a way to share the information. Um, on that note, this idea of trauma-informed approaches really came out in a lot of the interviews. Um, in a lot of cases, it wasn't um, so much about who they talked to or what service provider they were dealing with, but the approach and how um, trained that person was about domestic violence um, that really made um, such an impact on them. And we also heard about the need to include other types of community leaders that we wouldn't maybe necessarily think of as a service provider, but who are very involved in communities. Um, one that came up was um, religious leaders, ensuring that they're um, properly trained, have resources and can help connect because they do know a lot about um, families and there are um, a, high number of religious communities in rural areas of Canada. So thinking about who these other folks, other community leaders um, might be is also really important. So in this um, excerpt from an interview with the survivor, um, she's talking about um, a lack of collaboration between services. So in this testimony, um, she's talking about how the police were involved, um, but because the mother retracted the statement and charges weren't laid, um, there was no sort of follow up and child protection services were never involved. Um, so this was one of the cases where they really felt that they sort of fell through the cracks and that there should have been more people looking out for them, particularly for children. 
um, exposed to or experiencing domestic violence. So uh, we also heard about the need for specialized training. And so uh, police, teachers, healthcare workers, there was a generalized lack of specialized training. This is something we've also heard at the center. You know, there's more need for, for uh, specialized training, especially in rural areas. And so in some ways, COVID has helped us because uh, we're offering more and more of our uh, training and information sessions online. And so that really cuts down the costs for them and so it's become much more accessible. Um, training that includes uh, gender bias and so there was, uh, um, yeah, it, it just, uh, the, the sensitivity to gender diversity and uh, the impacts, the differing impacts on uh, survivors depending on their gender. And then um, ongoing opportunities, okay, so that we know that there, there is training but that it needs to be kept up. Um, and, and this had to do with sort of the, the variety of responses people got along the way, okay? So that, you know, sometimes the response would be good, sometimes it wouldn't be good. And it just seemed like, you know, there were some old school kind of service providers and those that had um, more up-to-date kind of training. And so this next quote uh, refer, refers specifically to the police and to teachers to help them recognize what's going on and what to do. And then this one also mentions, and not a one-time training thing, to, but to have it done multiple times because you have to practice. It has to remain front of mind. It can't just be something where you get your certificate and then you're done, and then you don't have to do it again for 30 years. And so uh, this call for more specialized training um, came from participants themselves. Yeah, and of course, last but not least, um, financial supports of all kinds were mentioned over and over um, from survivors. Um, so survivors talked about needing short-term financial supports in order to physically leave um, the home of the abuser. Um, things like needing um, a deposit or first month's rent, um, those initial setup costs booking movers, um, buying furniture, all of these types of things are not stuff you would maybe have a, a bunch of money just laying around for. So um, more um, grants and, and short-term um, supports in that sense. Of course, affordable housing is a big part of that. A lot of times um, folks just can't leave the abuse because they can't afford to and they don't have anywhere affordable um, and affordable and safe mm -hmm. to go to. That's also a really big part of it. Um, and I mean, it's like a squeaky wheel, more funding for services and shelters. We hear that over and over and over at probably every event um, that the MMFC does, but um, it really is such a significant barrier to doing most of the things that we've discussed today. All of this um, awareness raising, prevention training, um, efforts in schools, all of that requires financial resources. Um, we were at an event a couple of months ago hosted by GNB, and one of the things that they mentioned really stuck with me of the sense of we can't run um, domestic violence prevention on the backs of spaghetti suppers. This can't just be a fundraising model. Government um, really needs to invest in a real way. And I think that last point, I'm gonna point out that today we have uh, Melanie here from the toolkit, It's Your Business. Um, we, uh, okay, great. We also heard uh, from survivors that their employers were really important, okay? Because of the financial costs of leaving, they needed to stay in their jobs. But as we know, domestic violence disrupts your ability to work. And so it was really important. There were several stories in which the, the employer played a key role in terms of supporting uh, the survivor uh, to uh, continue to work, but then also deal with what was going on. And so we have a quote from one of the survivors. 
Yeah, so in this particular quote, the survivor's ex-husband was bipolar and um, a user of alcohol and drugs. So they had um, four children and staying in her employment and being able to be honest with her employer about what she was going through um, is really what allowed her to transition um, and support her children as a single mother, um, to stay employed, to be able to move. Um, so in this case, um, having informal and also formal accommodation and support from employers was really critical. So in this incident, um, the children actually show up at work saying, you know, dad is not able to, to take care of us and is, is being violent. And from that point, the employer knew and was able to offer her, you know, time off, accommodation, support, and things like informal support of allowing the kids to um, come with her to work when she had no other option um, to know that they were in a safe place and being looked after. So, um, helping employers do more of this is really um, critical to supporting survivors. Yeah, I, and so uh, Melanie has information for people. I think some of you are aware of that. But in this case, I, you know, I just, it's, it strikes me as, okay, so the child comes to the workplace and discloses, right? Like so mother's been working and living in this situation and probably trying to hide it uh, because she's afraid of losing her job. She's the only person, or she's not the only person bringing in employment, but she realizes I can't be dependent on this guy. This guy is, is really um, quite dangerous to me and my children, but she's got a strategy. Right, like she she knows if she has this job, then she can you know work towards leaving, and so this child comes, and then the risk is absolutely heightened. Right, like in that moment, she could have lost her job, and so the fact that that employer understood and um, you know exercised uh, compassion and 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 understanding. So we we don't want families to have to rely on the compassion of an employer. Right, we have legislation now in New Brunswick that uh, shows that uh, victims of uh, domestic and intimate partner violence and sexual violence are now entitled to uh, leave from the workplace in order to deal with things, but, but also that employers need to understand how to support those people when they do come forward or a situation like this happens. And so uh, we just thought that that was important in terms of um, um, you know, emphasizing how important it is that more employers become educated. Because as we know in New Brunswick, uh, some of the domestic violence homicides have taken place actually in the workplace, right? And so uh, it also is a way that employers can protect their employees. So just some concluding remarks. Um, after we looked at all of, so now we've kind of looked at the data thoroughly in terms of both the vulnerabilities and the strengths. And, uh, you know, um, we, we talked a lot about, you know, sort of what do we do in the face of a really mixed response from law enforcement? And, you know, we're really happy that people are working on this, but, you know, it is, these are, these are um, highly critical moments in which, uh, you know, decisions have to be made about life or death. And in the, in the face of what we're seeing, we're really, you know, um, supportive of a non-police response in coordination with police, with highly trained responders who know how to respond in these crisis uh, situations. And what's interesting in the research around uh, first response in a highly or potentially lethal situation is most survivors want that emotional support. Like they want the physical support, but they really like, this is it, right? Like they're at their, their wits end. You know, this is the last resort. And so that, that emotional support, which they tend then to get from the shelter providers, but that's, you know, if they get to a shelter, and so this rural response with somebody who's highly trained that can respond to the emotional needs of, of the survivor and their children is really important. Obviously, we're going to continue the mantra of we need more funding. We need core funding. We don't need um, you know, uh, to rely on, on governments, again, who have empathy and, and goodwill. We need a long-term commitment for some of these services because they have repercussions throughout the life course. So you know, our children and our schools need, need this kind of core funding um, for, for response from, from everybody. And then the idea of, of awareness raising, that uh, despite the fact that you know, we've been doing this kind of research for a long time, we still have to redouble our efforts in terms of uh, the public conversation. So thank you very much. And uh, we're open to questions or comments. Yeah. Um, great question.
with me tonight. I apologize for this a little bit at the beginning, um, but uh, so apologies if you've already addressed this. But um, in terms of the financial support needs, um, where there's reference to investing more into um, shelters and front services, I was curious if it's uh, the type of financial support that's needed is around kind of beefing up the resources and capacity of existing shelters, building new shelters, or combination of the two. And with a little bit of an asterisk of curiosity on my friend of some of the uh, whisperings I've heard around lately that I haven't had a chance to follow up on, um, <clears throat> is around uh, like criticisms of the, exist like the shelter model in and of itself and whether we should be building more shelters or uh, if that's going to pigeonhole us into a certain type of model. And I don't know if that, I don't, I don't know uh, the nuances or the recent research on that front, but I'm curious if either of you have insights on this. Okay. Um, I think the first part of your question um, what we heard from survivors was really a mix of a need for um, more resources for the services that exist and then a need for more resources in general. And particularly in these rural contexts, the need for um, shelters that are in a city to have more outreach and connection um, to the, the surrounding areas. So that could mean maybe not putting a shelter in one of those communities, but to have um, better transportation and um, outreach workers, more outreach workers available, more funding for outreach workers to uh, spend more time in surrounding communities. So um, yeah, I think it was really across the board of the work that's being done is amazing. Um, and we need more of it. And um, for shelter workers to not spend their time writing grant applications every three months um, in order to provide these services, but for that to be extra, if you wanna do something extra, apply for these wonderful grants that exist, but to have core funding um, to do the, the baseline services. Yeah, and I think in terms of our last, or our last slide there, in terms of recommendations, like the domestic out violence outreach workers and um, their collaboration with police, I think I think that's something we really need to look into in terms of a rural response, given the very high risk of lethality in rural areas. You know, so I, I don't want to see a young social work driving into a social worker driving into a farm, you know, that's 15 kilometers from anybody else and there's there's guns. You know, I think that's just really unwise, right? But then to be accompanying. Uh, a well-trained police officer so that they could do, you know, the outreach kind of work. Now, again, you run the risk of, oh, why were the police at your place, you know? And so there's, there's a lot, there's, I think there is a lot of room for uh, alternative kinds of ways of, of doing um, the work in order to help provide safety. And so, yeah, I agree. I think it's existing resources need to be stable so that then we can start looking at some of these more innovative responses. So around the use of guns in rural communities, um, with the new proposed legislation around uh, Bill C-21 with the red and yellow flags, do you think that that will be helpful or harmful uh, as it relates to folks in rural communities? Well, guns came up a lot. Um, you know, in, yeah, they did come up a lot uh, in terms of uh, risk you know, or how, how afraid they were that they, you know, and, and frequent, you know, he held a gun to my head or, you know, like that, that just was a really common experience. And so the removal of guns, I think would, would play in, and in many cases they were removed, but there is just seems to be unlimited access to, to guns, you know, and so I guess you know, they didn't, our, our survivors uh, that we looked at the transcripts from, they didn't really talk about that specifically, um, but you know, that, that, that they were, um, they played a prominent role in, in their lives. Um, and then, yeah, the guns also being used on animals, mm -hmm. uh, like that, you know, he, he threatened me with a gun, but he actually shot my dog or he actually killed my horse or something like that. That was, that was kind of, uh, frequent too, but not in terms of, um, you know, specific responses about, uh, you know, how do I get someone to take the guns away? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 